All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this um, new edition of the uh, CPR-TCPD uh, Dialogue in Indian Politics. Uh, I'm, we are particularly uh, pleased to uh, welcome uh, Louis uh, Tillin today from uh, King's College and the King's India Institute. Uh, Louise has been working for uh, some time now on uh, Indian federalism uh, and, uh, and, and, and state politics and has uh, contributed to the um, Oxford short series uh, precisely on that topic. Um, all the discussions we've had uh, over the past, you know, couple of years about the transformation of India's political regime, uh, about the transformation of, you know, electoral practices, you know, in, in India, consequences of the rise of the BJP have had uh, impact on uh, Indian federalism, but in ways that we don't always necessarily see or measure. So this is really topical that this book should come out. Uh, now, at a time where uh, things seem to be a little bit in flux, there's a need for clarity, and we are looking forward to Louis to provide uh, that uh, clarity. So without much further ado, uh, welcome uh, at uh, CPR, and welcome to uh, this uh, series, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and let me just start by saying a, a big thank you to both CPR and to the Trivedi Centre for um, hosting this book discussion this afternoon. Um, when I first agreed to write this, this book on Indian federalism, it was now a good three or four years ago, and while uh, federalism was coming back into the forefront of our concerns, I hadn't quite anticipated just how topical it would be when it came out um, shortly after the Lok Sabha elections this year in, in um, in June. Um, so uh, I find myself, uh, well, I find it, I'm finding it very difficult to move away from a concern with federalism at the moment. As much as I try to draw my, 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 my attentions to other subjects, um, I keep coming back to federalism. And it's, um, it's really nice to um, have the opportunity today to talk a bit about this book and um, hopefully in discussion to reflect on um, some of the changes that we're seeing in the present moment um, in uh, the federal sphere. So I thought I'd just take 15, 20 minutes or so to talk a, a little bit about what I argue in this book um, and, and then open up to, to discussion. I think perhaps useful to start with the notion that federalism is both an idea um, as well as a set of political institutions. Um, and that federalism takes a distinctive shape wherever it has taken root. Um, as an idea, we can think of federalism as a shared and multi-layered conception of sovereignty, um, going back to some of the classic definitions of federalism. It is a mode of governance, um, an idea um, of uh, political union that brings together both the notion of shared rule um, so shared rule within a shared um, political union but combines that with an element of self-rule. Um, and this means that at least two levels of government within a federal system each share in the task of governing but also each have their own sphere of autonomy. Um, and most federal constitutions are, uh, have a distribution of powers between those levels of government that are protected by a written constitution um, and usually a Supreme Court as an arbiter of territorial disputes between the levels of government. So that's federalism as an idea, um, and an idea uh, which has normative underpinnings, um, but also as a particular kind of political institution underpinned by a particular kind of constitution. Um, and I think it's also worth recognising that, um, in part owing to um, the, that, uh, that those ideas of federalism, federalism also needs to be, to be understood um, in practice as a compromise. Um, it is a compromise between ideas of the nation and of the region. Um, it is a compromise between ideas of universalism and of diversity. Um, and it is a compromise between some of the different ends, um, the different goals that political institutions are brought into being to serve, 
Um, and some of those ends might be intention, um, and in, uh, to um, some minds might um, be argued to, to uh, un some ends undermine others. Um, so some of those ends include the accommodation of um, ethnic and linguistic diversity, uh, the management of ethnic conflict, but also the management of the economy um, and the achievement of economic development um, and uh, the, uh, the pursuit of an efficient, effective form of administration. Um, and I think owing to the tensions between those different kinds of purposes, um, we need to recognise that federalism is nowhere a perfect blueprint for um, achieving economic management, uh, economic growth, the effectiveness of administration, um, uh, the reduction of inequality. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which federalism um, is uh, an, an imperfect political institution, but without it, things might be much worse. And I think that is absolutely crucial to remember in the current um, moment in India. Without um, federalism, both the consolidation of democracy, um, but also the accommodation of conflict would have been much, much harder um, in India. And from that observation, I um, move in the book, and I'll just sketch this a little here. I move to um, provide a picture of Indian federalism that underscores some of its distinctiveness. Um, those of you who have been scholars of the Constitution or of political science or political institutions will often, often have come across um, the uh, appendage quasi um, when thinking about Indian federalism, that Indian federalism is a quasi-federal um, system. And that um, uh, appendage was given to Indian federalism in the 1950s and 1960s by constitutional scholars who looked at what India um, had designed in the Constituent Assembly and argued that it departed in very important and in some ways radical ways from earlier models of federalism that prevailed in um, other parts of the world, notably um, the United States, but also Canada and, and Australia and parts of Europe. Um, what I argue in the book is that we need to move away from the idea that Indian federalism is somehow a derivative or a diminished form of federalism, um, and instead to recognize that it has distinctive traits of its own. Um, some of those distinct, distinctive traits include the fact that the Indian federal model is unusually centralized um, in um, comparative terms. It enshrines a very strong model of interdependence between the central government and state governments, which, which moves away in quite important ways um, from more decentralized models of federation um, in older um, federal systems uh, where a, a doctrine of traditionally a doctrine of um, separate spheres of authority um, persisted um, and in many ways made it quite difficult for um, federal interventions in regional matters. Um, and uh, the last important way in which the Indian constitution is distinctive when it comes to federalism is the flexibility of the federal model um, that was designed. And I can come back to what I mean by that flexibility, but I think it's important to start um, with an appreciation of um, the fact of its flexibility because um, the flexible approach to federalism, and of course, you know, we also need to remember that um, the, the Constitution itself does not proclaim itself um, to be federal, um, and that is also a reflection of the distinctiveness of the kind of constitutional model that's being adopted. But um, it's important to recognize um, this centralized yet flexible model of federalism because it has both been crucial for India's achievements, considerable achievements, in 
using federalism as a mode of um, accommodating uh, diverse diversity, um, especially um, ethno-linguistic identities. Um, so something like linguistic reorganization, the ling linguistic reorganization of state boundaries, which um, took place in India in the mid-1950s into the 1960s, would have been very different, very difficult um, in um, those older, uh, more rigidly interlocked systems of federalism that we see in other parts of the world. Um, but it is also, and this is the sting, the, flexi the flexibility inherent in Indian federalism has also, I would suggest, enabled some of the reversals that we've seen um, in the recent past, and notably, and, and we might come to this um, in discussion afterwards, but notably um, the um, abrogation of Article 370 recently. So this is a, a form of federalism that um, is uh, permissive of decisions made by democratic majorities. Um, and uh, it's also, uh, and importantly, because it is a parliamentary rather than presidential mode of fed federalism, um, this gives um, a lot of sway to changes in the party system um, and in, in parliament um, to producing changes in, um, in, in quite quick measure in the operation of and the design of Indian federalism. So that's an overview of the, some of the main um, premises of the book. Um, and I'll just give you a little taste of um, the chapters. It's a short, I mean, it's a long essay, but it's a short book. Um, and there are, there are four chapters. The first looks at um, constitutional design. The second um, looks at um, federalism and diversity um, and looks at India's record on the accommodation um, of, of diversity the relative success of linguistic federalism in India, which is another distinctive feature of Indian federalism when we think comparatively much of the pessimism, and there is much pessimism in the, in the scholarship on um, multi-ethnic, multilingual federalism, is influenced by um, the experience of the Soviet Union and the former Yugoslavia, um, where language formed the basis for the breakup of political unions. India is a very important counterexample um, of a federal system that has cohered and held together precisely because of its accommodation of linguistic identity. Uh, but the, this chapter on federalism and diversity also looks at some of the limits to accommodation, and there certainly are limits. Um, I've written extensively elsewhere about um, asymmetric federalism um, and some of those differential forms of autonomy that are also an important feature of the Constitution. Um, but we have both seen um, in recent months some of the vulnerability um, of those asymmet asymmetric measures. Um, and I, and I you know, have to underscore, and I, and I make this point quite clearly in the book, that the vulnerability of something like Article 370 long predates its actual abrogation um, uh, this year. Um, very, very many um, parts of the Constitution have been extended um, to, to Jammu and Kashmir without a constituent assembly in the state via Article 370. Um, so this has been a very long process of closer integration of the state, um, now Union Territory, um, with, with the Union. Um, and there are, in other parts of the country, not only Kashmir, but of course in the Northeast, also places where concerns for national security um, have uh, often trumped the, a more democratic form of accommodation within um, uh, these regions that have been granted asymmetric features of autonomy, uh, asymmetric forms of autonomy in the Constitution. And of course, there's a much wider question about the difficulty that India has, um, has had historically and to date in finding a means of um, uh, providing territorial um, recognition to um, states that have a, um, a religious minority as a local majority. So that's chapter two. Um, the third chapter of the book comes to the question of governing India or the challenge of governing India. Um, and uh, the management of centre-state relations. And that book hinges around what I suggest is a, is a kind of double challenge. Um, so 
uh, on one hand, the question of how the centre seeks to achieve policy coordination at an all-India level, how the centre resolves collective a action problems, and, arguably most importantly, how the central government ensures that central policies, national policies, are implemented across the length and breadth of, um, of uh, the states of India. Um, and that is also a, 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 a problem um, that has taken on a new dimension um, in an era of uh, political dominance by one national party um, at the centre, uh, but, a, but, a, but a party at the centre that still has to rely heavily on the states for implementation. Um, and the, the parallel or the, the flip side of that challenge for the centre is the question of how state governments exert influence at the centre, um, how they achieve a voice in shaping policy, um, but also how they manage their relationships with the centre in order to retain um, political and fiscal autonomy um, at the state level. Um, and I argue in this chapter that um, the functioning of the, or the, the, the changing nature of the party system, the political party system, has been crucial um, for the ways in which these, this double challenge has been negotiated by the centre and the states. Um, and that, again, the influence of the, part, the political party system in shaping Indian federalism um, also owes a lot to the particular constitutional design of, of federalism in India. Um, and the fourth chapter, the final chapter, looks at the role of federalism in, um, in economic, uh, right, federalism in the management of the economy. So if, uh, if we think of the language of cooperative and competitive federalism, um, the chapter three, look, which looks at centre-state relations, is concerned with the question of what cooperative federalism looks like in practice. Chapter, four, chapter four um, starts to uh, look more closely at competitive federalism, and um, this centres on um, the ways in which federalism has been invoked, especially since economic liberalisation, as a means of better governing um, the market and um, better enabling a process of um, economic liberalisation via unleashing uh, the competitive spirits of India's states. And of course this is um, part of the mandate of um, the Niti Aayog as a successor to the Planning Commission. So this chapter looks at the logic of um, what in academic literature is described as market-preserving federalism and it looks at the extent to which the ways in which competitive federalism has been practiced in India actually um, corresponds with the idea of federalism as a market pre pre preserving or producing device. Um, I look at some of the limits um, to this uh, notion of um, competitive federalism especially as it hits the reality of very diverse kinds of political economy at the state level. One of the core tenets of competitive federalism is an assumption that both capital and citizens are mobile, that they will move across state boundaries in order to find a jurisdiction where uh, the um, regulatory environment, the tax um, environment, the provision of public services, the provision or upholding of uh, the um, uh, labour rights, um, the implementation of social policy, the capital and citizens will somehow neatly sort themselves into, um, into regions which correspond with um, their preferences for um, public provision and economic regulation. Um, but in India and in very many other places, this simple um, notion of um, capital and um, citizen mobility breaks down very quickly. Um, and this is partly because of uh, the uh, close relationships that we see between state and capital um, within particular regions. Um, which uh, really undermine the notion of federalism as a level playing field. Um, and 
the absence of that kind of level playing field is also very important to bear in mind when we think about federalism's relatively um, mixed record um, in promoting or reducing interstate inequality. Um, in a situation, especially at the, the beginning of um, the 1990s, where there was already strong um, interstate inequality, um, the advent of liberalization and some of these more competitive notions of federalism has in fact enhanced rather than reduced um, regional inequality and um, it behoves us to remember that states are not e able to compete on an equal basis, um, whether we're thinking about their um, infrastructure development, um, the uh, kind of depth and capaciousness of state capacity, um, or uh, levels of human capital and investment in, in um, education and public health. Um, so in all sorts of ways, the absence of that level playing field um, undermines the idea that co competitive federalism is um, the engine for both um, driving economic growth, but um, also a more um, equitable form of economic growth across India. Um, so that's, that gives you a, a summary of some of the diverse terrain that the book covers, and, and these short introductions are really um, intended to provide you with a, a sense of the um, key, an entry point into these debates, and I hope the book achieves that. I think it's worth um, reflecting as I conclude that um, even as I was writing this book, um, although the warning signs were already there, um, but even as I was writing, we, there was still a sense that federalization or the deepening of Indian federalism um, felt like something of a linear process. Um, and this was very much supported by both the regionalization of political life um, and also economic liberalization, which had um, given the states a much more important role um, in, um, in, in managing flows, of, um, flows within the economy. But the return of a party with a um, majority in parliament um, and a rapidly increasing dominance of um, political life at the state level, and of course we have important um, counter examples to that in, in recent state elections, but um, we still have um, a, a, a uh, form of political dominance that um, is quite unlike anything that India has seen for the last 30 years. Um, and in this context, renewed or return to political dominance, we're also entering a new phase um, of, of federalism and one that I think disrupts the idea that ever, deeping, ever deepening federalization is, um, is a linear or um, inevitable um, process. I'll close there. Thank you.